Welcome to all of you. It is so good to be with you today. I'm Kristen Hammett, and I am so glad you've joined us for today's webinar on cultivating high-capacity donors. Before we jump into to today's topic, I want to remind you of a few things. First, please engage with us on Facebook. Um, our ministry services Facebook group is um, a place where you can really learn from others, hear um, collaborative information from those ministries that have tuned in. We've asked questions of one another and shared information. You'll also great, get some great um, tools, both from this webinar and beyond. So we certainly encourage you to join us on Facebook and you will um, find value both in the community as well as the information that is shared there. Our goal at um, the Signatory Ministry Services is to equip you in your development efforts and to partner with you. As you develop your donor relationships, you can view us as a resource for training, community, and partnership when you work with your donors. Before we get into today's webinar, I want just to remind you that we want to make this a conversation. So please ask questions as you have them. When you're looking at your screen, you'll see a they tab and toolbar. So please um, just engage with us, talk with us, converse with us. We want to know um, where you might have questions and where we can add some information that might help you. We will also address some questions at the end. So if you want to save them for the end, you can do that as well. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about major donors and cultivating relationships with ministry partners that have capacity. And regardless of where you find yourself in your development journey, fundraising with major donors and developing major donor relationships is key in your strategy. So that is why I'm so excited about Chris being with us today and today's topic. Chris is a connector, consultant, and communicator. He's joined us here on our webinars before. He is the co-author of Contagious Generosity, and has spent many years um, in ministry leadership with crew. He's been an executive pastor, and he currently serves as director of generosity initiatives for Leadership Network and as a uh, senior strategist, generosity strategist for Generous. He has consulted um, really across both the United States and I believe also in Europe, has really done a lot of great work in this generosity space. And so I am so pleased to welcome Chris to this conversation. Thanks, Kristen. It's good to be here. Uh, thanks for bearing with us. As, I'm, as you can see, I'm working from my home office, and so does my wife, and she needed to print something a couple of minutes ago, and that's what that was. But uh, That's okay. That's how this goes. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is the world headquarters of our work, so that everything happens here. But I'm excited to be with you. I really am. Thanks for inviting me uh, to participate in another podcast. And I love this topic because I think it's super important that we, we recognize that, you know, the, the diff there are different kinds of, of people that give to our organizations or ministries, and so we need to have a unique relationship with them. So how about if I just dive into my my slides here, Kristen, and we can kind of walk our way through this, talk our way through it as we, as we navigate it. Sound good? That sounds great. Let's go. All right. So my first, the first thought I want to mention is just, and sort of as a bottom line, kind of begin with the end in mind, big idea, if you will, is that we, we, we really need to remember that this whole conversation is about spiritual formation and not fun development. This when we talk to somebody about generosity and stewardship, when we talk to them about giving to the work that we do, when we talk to someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ, for example, about investing in ministry in the kingdom, this really is a spiritual issue. And so um, I, I guess I have to put it this way, and I, and I hope no one will be offended by this, but I, I, I work with churches and organizations all over the world, uh, well, mostly American and, and, and Western Europe, Canada. But, um, and I'm helping them. I'm helping them with generosity and stewardship and giving issues. I'm helping them raise money. I'm helping them fund the work of their organizations and ministries. But if I believed that my job was to get up every day and just do this kind of fundraising, it would be hard for me to stay motivated if, if I couldn't make the connection to how this is truly a spiritual endeavor. 
that we're on. So I guess what I want to do is I want to encourage everyone who's participating in the webinar. I want to, I want to remind you that the work that you do is ministry. It's not just fundraising. It's, we like to call it the ministry of asking. If someone asks you, are you in the ministry? The answer is yes, you are because you're out there doing work that is worth doing and encouraging people to invest God's resources in something that will outlast them. And that's not just fundraising, that's ministry. Especially as you think about the work that you're gonna be doing uh, with people that, that have capacity, maybe those that God has blessed with wealth. So just sort of a, a starting point there, if you will. Um, the next big idea that I think is, is good to be reminded of is that not all givers are the same, right? We, we and, and many of you, of course, know this, and you have different kinds of strategies for different kinds of givers, but you'd be surprised perhaps to know that's a very uncommon approach in, the, in many of the churches that I work with. Many churches think about all givers as they're all the same. We talk to everybody in the same way, and that's really a miss um, because we need to recognize that not just in churches, but also in ministry organizations and other enterprises, um, there are different kinds of givers and their giving impacts the organization differently. So you can see on this very simple, maybe even overly simple uh, illustration here, that when the people that have high capacity, there are a small number of them, but when they give, their giving represents a large portion of the need to support the work of the organization. Um, then there's this group kind of in the middle. Uh, their, their, their giving is very important and significant. Uh, and then there's this large group that you could call the congregation, you could call them the crowd, if you will, if you're out there sort of in your, in your work is not necessarily related to uh, congregations. But when they give, their, their, the result of their giving is, is a small percentage of the dollars. Uh, it should say, by the way, dollars, not donors at the top, that's a typo. So it should say on the bottom, it should say total of donors, and at the top it should say total dollars. Sorry about that. Um, here's what I'm trying to say. Um, we should have a different conversation with each kind of giver who is supporting the work of our organizations. And we don't exclude the people whose contribution would be small just because it would be small. We want to engage them too, if we can, but we want to make sure that we're having a unique conversation with the different kinds of people that fund our work, which sort of leads us, I guess, right to the to the topic that you wanted to focus on specifically today, Kristen, and that is this idea of how do we cultivate, how do we engage, how do we mobilize the people who have uh, the higher than normal average, higher than normal capacity to fund the work that we're doing. And I think as we move into that conversation, one of the things that we wanna keep in mind is that these folks are not better than others, they're just different. Um, it, right? It's so important to keep in mind that, that when someone has wealth or high capacity to give, it is, it is because the Lord has entrusted to them resources that, that he wants them to steward wisely and well. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that people that have wealth haven't worked really hard. They're not really good at their, their job. They're not very talented and skilled. All of those things can be true. But fundamentally, we believe that if you have something, it's because God gave it to you. And what he wants you to do is be a steward of it, manage it wisely and well. So people that have wealth. Hey Chris, yeah. Can I chime in here just for a second? I know that we've got a variety of sizes of ministries that um, are chiming in today or tuning in today. And I think it's important, I, I know I get this question a lot, what do you consider a major donor? Who do you consider um, really that, that person who I should be spending more time with because they account for more of the giving? And I think that definition for a major donor changes from ministry to ministry. So depending on the size and scope of the ministry, a major donor may mean something different to different folks who are listening. So I don't want us to get hung up so much on that as much as the principles of what it is that you're sharing today. Because I think that as these ministries grow and, the, and there's always room for growth, right? We can engage more and more people that do have more and more capacity to support the work we're doing. So these are really good principles that, that can really give us some insight into 
those folks that do have more wealth or more capacity to support our work. Yeah, it's really a good point, Kristen. Everything in this context is sort of relative, right? It's all relative to the other givers who are giving to your organization. And, and, um, and so these principles are pretty transferable. You know, I'm going to talk a lot about, about the unique opportunity and challenge that people that God has blessed with wealth, some of the things that they face. And some of those are the major donors for, the, for your organization, if you're participating in the webinar. Some of the major donors for your organization might not be considered wealthy by some standards, but many of these principles, of course, still apply. One of the big ideas that we need to keep in mind as we talk to different kinds of people differently about giving to our organizations is that um, talking to the people who are the leading givers to your organization or cultivating a relationship with them is not favoritism in the, in the inappropriate sense of the word. Some of you will be familiar, of course, with what the Bible says in James about not showing favoritism to um, those who have wealth. The passage really describes a very awkward scenario in which someone would literally take a poor person out of their seat and give that seat to someone who has wealth, literally preferring that person with wealth over the person who has no wealth. And of course, James is uh, admonishing us to never do that, never show favoritism to someone based on wealth. All those in favor of agreeing with James say aye, right? That's me, we don't wanna disagree with what the Bible said. That's not the same thing as having a unique conversation or a different conversation with someone who has higher capacity than others. It's just, it's not, it's not better, it's just different. We're not showing favoritism, we're just showing intentionality. Um, we're just being specific and having a conversation with them that is unique to them. One of the things to keep in mind is you work with people in your organizations, members of your, your donor base, uh, who perhaps have um, been blessed by God with wealth. Remember that wealth brings wonderful opportunities to someone. Wealth brings tremendous, in some ways, um, freedom, but it also can bring a tremendous amount of complexity. You know, the person who has wealth has many of the same problems the rest of us have, right? <laughs> Right? They may have difficult teenagers, they may have a troubled marriage, they may have difficult neighbors, they may have just gotten a really hard to hear diagnosis. All of those things are true of all of us. And they have wealth, and wealth brings complexity. Uh, the person who has wealth always often wonders about the motives of the people in their life. And, and those of us that work with people and invite them to give, we need to keep in mind it is very common for people in our, that we're talking to who have wealth to wonder, why are you talking to me? Is it only because you want my gift, my financial gift? Do you care about me or just what I can do for you or for your organization? And those kinds of complex behind the scenes, sort of behind the eyeballs of the giver issue are the things that we need to be keeping in mind. Now, of course, we'll never go wrong in the way we interact with people that have wealth in the way we interact with people that don't have wealth, we'll never go wrong if discipleship is our goal. If our goal with every kind of giver to our organization is, my job is to help this person grow spiritually. My job as a person who has been entrusted to do this ministry of asking in the kingdom, my job is discipleship. Boy, if I keep that in mind, then I'm just trying to help people grow. I'm just trying to help people take their next step. It's not about how much money I can get from them. It's about what I can do for them to help them grow spiritually. So just, I wanted to start there by reminding us that when we talk to people, we're talking about major donors or high capacity. It's important to keep in mind, they're not better. They're just different. And it's, we need to keep that in mind. Now, when you think about people that have high capacity or could be major donors to your organization, one of the problems is that we tend to sort of buttonhole them and think about them all the same. Like they all, they're all sort of 50-ish uh, or, or older. They're all sort of uh, have a certain kind of job or professional job. And boy, what a miss that is to only be, to, to have created kind of a stereotype of who this major giver must be. When we do that, we very, very often miss people who might be excited about making a major gift to our organization, but we've never engaged them at that level. So we need to be looking for young, you know, young families who may 
um, have been blessed with wealth. Maybe they have two professional incomes and maybe they've got some other money that they brought into their, their young uh, adulthood. Maybe we need to be looking at single working professionals who have got massive, in many cases, liquidity and excess capacity because they have fewer responsibilities than others who are perhaps older and more established in their family. People that own their own business, people that have recently become empty nesters, people that are looking toward the end of their life and thinking, how can I give a gift, a legacy kind of gift that will outlive me? How can I invest in this organization in a way that really sends a message to the future? So I guess my, my observation for you is, think about those that you consider major donors to your organization and ask yourself, have you sort of created a, a pretty slim category of who these folks are? Or do you have sort of a broad understanding of who they might be? And who else could you invite to, to potentially be a part of that group um, if you start thinking about different kinds of categories, spreading your, you know, just kind of thinking about it differently. Yeah, Chris, I really okay. like what you just said. Um, I like, I mean, you know, I'm thinking about my own development background and the challenge, I feel like the heart challenge for the development officers is to truly um, view your job as ministry. So don't look at these folks with dollar signs in your eyes. Um, they're not an ATM. You, it really is about relationship, right? When you talk at the, at, at the beginning of a slide or two ago about the complexity of wealth and what that presents just in the life of that more wealthy, higher capacity um, potential donor. But then this is really, it, it continues to challenge a development officer to not limit my focus to the folks that are necessarily looking the part of, of some of those wealthy individuals. So you're 45 and older, um, you know, as well established in their careers. But this kind of opens up that definition a little bit and challenges me. Again, personally, I'm thinking about it from my own experience to reevaluate and check my heart. Am I making too slim of a definition of who I'm looking for and instead really make this not only a discipleship opportunity for other folks, but also really a um, opportunity for me to get my heart right and to be um, leaning on the Lord for some guidance and direction to who, where I should really invest in some, some relationships with people that may not even be looking the part necessarily, but do have some capacity that, that may not be quite as obvious as others. It, that's really a good observation, Kristen. And also keep in mind that may, they may, it might be that they don't look the part yet, but you can, you might see they, boy, this, this young woman looks like she is on a trajectory to become a very successful, very um, somebody who will have capacity. What if we started to engage that person, introducing them to the organization, perhaps even introducing her to others who are major givers to our organization so that, so that she's already sort of involved in that conversation even before she might have the ability to kind of write that transformational check. Um, that's discipleship. That's encouraging people who are heading in a direction but may not, may not be there just yet. Um, as you move through this conversation about high capacity givers and people that God is blessed with the capacity to really make a kind of a game changing investment in an organization, we always talk about vision. Vision's good, right? We got to have vision. The organization needs to have clear vision. Um, many, I imagine many of the people that are participating right now in this organization, right, Kristen, they've been through many meetings, many conversations, many working groups, uh, sitting around tables. Let's talk about clarifying and articulating what our vision is going to be. You got to have a vision. Super important, right? Got to have it. But it's not the only thing. And what I want to, what I want to say to you that is a little, maybe a little challenging for some of us to keep in mind is, with all due respect, um, your vision is not the only one that matters. Meaning, the giver might have a vision too. Here's, here's the problem. The development officer, the president of the organization, the leader of the organization gathers people together, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, and casts this super compelling vision about why we do what we do and why it matters and why it's so important. And all of that is really great. You got to be able to do that. But you'll not see a really uh, engaged response from a high capacity giver unless your vision matches their vision. 
unless unless you've connected what you do to what matters to them, it's very unlikely that they're going to give a large gift. Um, but Bob Buford, who was one of our one of my mentors, of course, the founder of Leadership Network, Bob Bob wrote the book Halftime. Uh, had had a tremendous impact on countless men and women, helping them to make this transition from success to significance. Bob used to talk about sort of the Home Depot model uh, of you can do it, we can help. And what he would say is that many, in many times, uh, ministries and churches, the leadership of the ministry or the church or the organization or the charity will say to the givers, we can do it, you can help. Meaning we have a vision, we have a plan, we have this great idea, will you help us with it? And what Bob would say is, you know, with all due respect, I have a vision too. Like, I, I believe that God has entrusted me with the stewardship of his resources, and I think he wants me to use them in a way that, that makes sense to me, not just to you. So here's what I always recommend. One of the very best questions you can ever ask anybody, this isn't just, by the way, for people who might be a major donor, but anybody who is connected to your organization is, what do you like best about our organization? What do you like best about our church? What do you like best about our ministry? What do you like best about it? And then, and then be quiet and let them answer and listen to what they say. Um, because whatever it is that they say, you can be sure that's part of the ministry or the organization that they really care about. That's, that matches up with their vision, kind of what, what they're passionate about. And so if you can find a way to make your ask or your approach to them with regard to giving connected to the thing that they've told you they're passionate about or they care about, you're much more likely to see them respond. It's about vision, yes. But it's not just about your vision. It's also about the giver's vision and finding the sort of the, the, the place where those meet. That's where sort of the magic happens with regard to people responding and, and seeing high capacity givers really get excited. I think that's great, Chris. I really, I, you have said just in a different way what I have said and what we share sometimes in, in kind of some coaching sessions, and that is you need to not go in with kind of your elevator pitch. Like it's, it's not a five minute sales presentation. This is a relationship building process. And so going in and learning what their story is. And so not just asking the question, but then when you said, listen, um, that's really a critical piece of this whole journey and, and, setting aside for a moment your own vision and instead, or your organization's vision, and instead taking a moment to really get to know and listen to that high capacity donor, and then making those connection points about how that connection connects with your ministry and your vision. So I really love that approach. It's not our, it's not our natural instinct, right? I started in sales and then moved to ministry and I, I took too many of those skills or those learned behaviors from the sales world into the development world and, and they don't work as well. Yeah, that's, a, that's really true. It, it, we've got to make the connection and we do it best in the context of relationship. You couldn't, you couldn't have said that better, which kind of leads me to this next idea. It, one of the best ways to think about relationships and to think about um, cultivating relationships is to recognize your goal is not just that you would have a one-to-one -one relationship with the giver, but also that you would be the one who helps to facilitate them having other relationships with people who love your organization, who believe in your ministry, and who care about what you do. The very best thing that you can do is to try to put these folks in community, in contact, in connection with one another, because life change happens in circles, doesn't it? It happens in circles, not rows. It isn't just uh, uh, one person speaking to many, or even just one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's, life change tends to happen when we're in community with one another. So, the, so wise uh, ministry leaders will, will look for ways to create community among the people who are, who are supporting your work. Now, that could just be an annual or a semi-annual kind of fellowship dinner for the people that give to your organization. It could be, hey, I'm in this city and I know we have a major giver who's in this city. 
uh, boy, there's another person that I know that's really passionate about the work that we do. Let me see if I can connect those two and see if they might hit it off and we could create some sort of relationship there. Putting people in community can really make a difference. And when we have them in community, one of the most effective things that we can do, and so many of you already know this, right, is tell stories. We want to tell stories. We want to tell stories of life change. We want to tell stories of generosity. We want to tell stories of impact. But what I've discovered is that there are two kinds of stories that are really, really powerful to tell when we're gathering our, our givers, the people that will support our ministry. You could, you could think of them as giving to stories and giving from stories. Now, we, when I explain this, you'll think, ah, it's not rocket science, but that's, that's why it's, I think, a powerful principle. A giving to story sounds like this. When you give to our organization, this happens in the ministry. When you give to our organization, this happens in the lives of our clients, those we serve, those we impact. When you give to this church, here's what happens in the children's ministry, right? You get it? It's sort of a, when you give to us, this happens. Those are powerful stories. I want to hear those kind of stories. Keep telling those kind of stories. But in some ways, they're not nearly as powerful as what I like to call giving from stories. A giving from story sounds something like, um, you know, I've, I've heard for years about this organization and the good work that it does, but I, you know, I never really felt motivated to give until recently I, I was in an, you know, in a meeting or whatever and, and felt like I wanted to respond and I did. And let me tell you what's been happening kind of in my heart since I've engaged with this organization or in our family since we've connected with this organization. It's changed the way we think about ministry. It's changed the way we think about ministry to the poor. It's changed the way, whatever the organization is, what you're telling is, man, when I gave, something happened on the inside of me. It isn't just what happened out there, it happened in here. Those kinds of stories are transformational. They're, they're powerful. They sort of work while you sleep. They're a little bit harder to tell, they're a little harder to find, but boy, if you can, if you can show me those kinds of stories, then that motivates me. I want to experience that. I want to experience what someone else has just described when they're describing something that's happening uh, that was transformational on the inside for them. Um, Chris, can I last, ask a question what? about that? Sure. So when you say the giving from stories and how the transformation that's happened in the donor's life or the giver's life, um, you know, what, what I immediately think is, well, that's, that really depends on how well the ministry is stewarding that relationship. Because if I'm not, if I've got a donor who's giving me, uh, you know, who's donating significantly to my ministry, and I'm not following up with them on impact or calling them with a story of what has been happening at the ministry, I'm not confident life change has been happening for them because they wrote a check and I didn't follow up, so it, and you push back on me if I'm kind of not being fair here, but I feel like what that, to get a giving from story, you have to do ministry to your donors. Totally. Is that fair? Totally. You won't hear it. You won't know it. Um, you, you know, when you, when you follow up with people, you ask them, you know, like we said, we talked about what do you like best about what we're doing? You're following that up, but you're staying in connection with them. You're staying in relationship with them. And it isn't just for the purpose of, of doing the next ask, right? It's for the purpose of continuing to cultivate the relationship, continuing to be a positive influence on that giver from a spiritual point of view. Um, boy, it's, there's nothing, there's nothing like the, the, the ministry, the organizations that Susan and I support, many of those um, kind of gift, those development people that we interact with, they know our story. Like they know us because they've taken the time to cultivate a relationship with us and understand what makes us tick. And so they're hearing kind of stories of things that are happening because they're reaching out to me and they're asking those questions. Those are the kinds of things that I really admire and they're super powerful when you can retell those kinds of stories. I think that's great. Uh, I think that's a challenge to development folks to maybe change the conversation a little bit with some of those high capacity donors. And how do I find out what it means to them to be involved in this work? I mean, maybe that's a fair question. 
Why do you continue to support this work? What does it mean for you? What is it doing for your family? Um, what, you know, I don't know that we, I know I don't think I ever recall asking that question of a donor. It was yeah. more, thank you, and here's what else we're doing. Um, here's what your money is doing. So I was pretty good at reporting impact, but not very good at really asking more of the hard question. What do you gain by joining us? What, what have you gained from this relationship? And part of the reason we don't ask that question is because we're not expecting there to be any impact in the life of the giver. And we're not necessarily doing anything to try to help produce that sort of impact by asking this, the disciple making kinds of questions um, and sort of engaging them and trying to encourage their heart. Again, a lot of this will happen in the context of community. When you put people in relationship with one another, they'll encourage one another. So as often as you can do that, it really helps. The last point here on this slide is just kind of a tactical thing I think is useful. Very, very often we approach givers in a one-to-one -one environment. And what I've discovered is that in many cases, a one-to-one -one meeting will work much better if that giver has already been in a, in a community of people and had a chance to hear or engage or participate, feel, sort of experience the organization or the ministry in a group first. It just creates this shared experience, this shared kind of um, a bucket of content, if you will, that I can then follow up one-on-one. -on -one. When I go just one-on-one, -on -one, there it's it can be it can be a little bit more shallow. So the one-on-one -on -one is great, but often it it works better after I've given that person an opportunity to experience community. Okay, let's move on. Next big idea is that as we've said before, this is ministry. This is the ministry of asking. Let me see if I can make this point here without belaboring it. You've, you've often heard people say that um, people don't give to need, they give to vision. Have you heard that? People don't give to need, they give to vision. That's the dumbest thing you could ever say, right? Because people love to give to need. Many of the organizations probably participating in our, in our webinar right now are people that are out there meeting real needs. When there's a hurricane, people give. When there's a tornado, people give. People, yes, people give to vision. Yes, they give to need. They also love to give when there's a unique opportunity or where there's a unique moment. But one of the things that we miss is that people also love to give to expectation in the context of community or relationship. Meaning when we can normalize that we're all, we're, we're all doing this. This is, this is what people do. This is when we're in a relationship with people and we're in the context of them, ex, not, not expecting that they would give in sort of a, in an inappropriate kind of demanding presumptive way, but ex expectation that says someone who is as committed to the Lord as you are, someone who is as clear eyed about the vision of what we're trying to accomplish as you are and who's been blessed as you are, I, I'm expecting that someone would also want to give. It's sort of an attitude on the part of the person who is doing the ministry of asking that it's okay for us to create this sense of expectation, uh, not demanding, but a sense of inevitable expectation that if I'm understanding you clearly, I know that you're gonna wanna respond to what I'm saying. Um, very often, as many of us know, high capacity givers don't wanna do what everyone else can do, which is why unique opportunities, unique um, experiences, um, uh, an ability to finish, get us over the finish line on a, on a goal is something often that is very motivating to a high capacity giver. Uh, hey, we're looking for one person to give this gift and that's going to be kind of the, the key kind of catalyst gift for the rest of our, of our effort. Often people that have been blessed with wealth or have high capacity, they, they, they're looking for something unique that they can say yes to, as opposed to just being one of the many who sort of says yes uh, in the same way that everyone else does. Um, the last little slide, a point here on this slide is just, again, this is kind of basic ministry of asking 101, but what I've seen is that very often we missed that there are kind of three, there are three steps or three key elements to the ministry of asking. There's, there's information, there's inspiration, and then invitation. Now, Forgive me for having all of those start with, with I. I know that's kind of cheesy sometimes, but it does help. Um, information, of course, answers the question, what are we doing? Like, what, what's the what? Like, what is the, what is the, what is the strategy? What is the, 
What is the outcome? What is the mission? What is the, what's the what? Uh, inspiration is really about why. Uh, it's about why and even why now. Is there urgency? Um, is there some unique need that must be met now, some unique opportunity that we can't pass up? Um, and then finally, invitation is when you actually ask somebody specifically to prayerfully consider making an investment and maybe even a specific investment. Now, here's what, I, here's what I'll tell you, and some of you already know this because you've been through this. I have bungled this over the course of my <laughs> career many times. For example, I have, I have given, and maybe you have too, I have given information and inspiration and then fumbled the invitation, meaning it was all right there. I gave them everything we needed. I had great materials, whatever, but I sort of dropped the ball when it came to a specific invitation to give. Also, I have been very, I think, at times very inspiring and then asked people to give. So I've had inspiration and invitation, but because I was squishy about the what, the, the information, people went, hey, you know what, Chris, this sounds great, but I, I mean, I'm, I, I get it, I think, but what are we doing again? And they're looking for the specific information. And then finally, I've sometimes given a lot of information and done an invitation without really inspiring anybody. What am I saying? When you're working with people that God is blessed with wealth and you're doing the ministry of asking, make sure that you're, you're, you're balancing all three of these things. Some people, and they'll, people will tell you if they're information people, they want more of it. People will let you know if they're really moved by stories and they're, they're focused on inspiration and then never fail to, to close. Uh, I hate to use a sales phrase, but never, never fail to complete the conversation by actually asking someone to respond. That's the ministry of asking. Uh, I think we've got just one more sort of big idea. And then, you know, Kristen, we can talk if you have any follow-up thoughts or questions. But this last one is really simple, I think. And it's just, you know, what you got to make sure that you stay engaged. You got to follow up with people. Don't, 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 do the, don't do the ministry of asking, get a gift from somebody and then sort of say, okay, great. I guess I'll call you back next time I need a gift right? Stay engaged, stay connected, do the follow-up, make sure that the thank you strategy is really, really good. And every, I'm sure that everybody listening, you're all professionals, you know how to do this, right? You say thank you. But one of the things you probably um, would be challenging for you to do would be to be, if you're having a conversation with one of your key givers and you discover that they've given a gift elsewhere, right? You, you're in, a, you're in a conversation with them and you find out they've given a major gift somewhere else. You know what? On behalf of the kingdom, on behalf of the king that we serve, it is really wise for you to say, you know what? Way to go. I am really proud of you. I just, even though that gift didn't go to our organization, I want, I want to say thank you to you for that because, because that's tremendous. In fact, a great question to ask is, what in the world is the Lord doing in your heart that would have caused you to give that gift? Again, even if it didn't go to you, because you want to hear that answer. You want to find out what moves them and you want to just be a part of the team. Um, I, years ago, one of my friends gave a very large gift to a, a ministry and his, told his pastor about it. And the pastor's comment was, yeah, those ministry guys are really good fundraisers, aren't they? Which was really a wound for my friend. I mean, basically what this pastor was saying is, you got taken by a slick fundraiser. You, and what he was implying was, you should have given the money to us. And then that's just ugly, right? Like, we, you don't want to do that. So, yes, say thank you no matter where the gift goes when you're following up. Always report results. Both live, lives changed. If you've got data, Use the data to let me know how it went. And by the way, when you raise money for an initiative, uh, an enterprise, an effort, a, a strategy, whatever, sometimes it doesn't go well. Sometimes it doesn't always accomplish everything that you hoped it would accomplish and you wanna sort of hide that from the giver. I, I strongly encourage you to be transparent and to say, listen, we, we raised these dollars, we, we did this strategy, and to be honest, it didn't go exactly the way we hoped it would. And here's why. Because in my life and in the life of a lot of people that give to organizations, a lot of stuff I do doesn't go well. 
right? I mean, the, a lot of the givers that you're talking to, the stuff in their business doesn't go well either. And they, they get up the next day and they try again. I remember years ago, um, raising about $50,000 to do an evangelistic strategy. We were going to do an outreach and we were very excited about it. And I had, we had a giver give us $50,000 to do it. And without giving you the whole story, it was an unmitigated disaster. The whole thing was a flop. It didn't go well. So I remember going back to this giver and saying, let me tell you what happened. And I explained the whole thing and I told him what we've learned. And his response blew me away. He said, when are we doing it again? I'd like to fund the next one. Right? What, it, what was he saying? Look, sometimes stuff doesn't work. But you came back, you told me what happened, you told me what you've learned, and I'm in. I'm still in. So I just want to encourage you, and be transparent, be honest, let people know what's really going on, as opposed to always feeling like you have to shine everything up and make it look flawless. People know better. <laughs> And then finally, the last thing is just remember, we, we, started, we started with this, so we might as well finish with it. Because this is about discipleship, because this is about uh, helping people grow, just, just work on the relationship. Don't only and always be looking for the next opportunity to do an ask. Be looking for the next opportunity to make a deposit in the heart, the life of that giver so that you can just stay in a relational context with them so that the next time you do want to come back and let them know what's happening in your organization, it doesn't feel like it's coming out of the blue. Um, that's, Great. I think hey, Chris, I've got a well. couple of thoughts. Yeah. Can I ask you Go a couple ahead. things or maybe just comment Please. on a couple of things? Yeah. Um, the first one is I love the concept of saying thank you, even if the gift doesn't go to you. Um, I think really that kind of goes back to this whole concept of, um, you know, you got to check your heart as a ministry person, as the development officer. Um, are you really pleased to see the kingdom grow, even if it's not through your doors, but it's someone else? So I think that's a great challenge. Um, and it also is a great ministry to the donor to know that you are not viewing them as the ATM machine, so to speak, right. but that you they are a person and they have a lot of different organizations or causes that they care about. And that is not only understood, but appreciated the value they play in the overall picture, not just your picture. Um, so I think that's a great challenge. And um, I think that it was just really a great ministry piece. The other thing um, I really just want to confess as a development officer is when we would have negative results or, or results that were not as glowing as I thought they would be or should be, I oftentimes found not in necessarily a um, dishonest way, but I would try to shape those numbers or finesse those numbers in such a way that they didn't look as bad as maybe they, did, they really were and explain away some of them. And while an explanation is appropriate, I think this is a great challenge um, to folks to just own it and say, you know what, we thought it was going to work this way. We had these obstacles. It didn't work out like we planned um, and how you're going to, you know, fix it going forward or how you've adjusted the strategy. So I think those are really great tips. So I appreciate that. I'm yeah, going to not, not let you off. Go ahead. I was just going to say it's, it's, I think it's appropriate to try to find the positive to look for the pot, right? To, to, Hey, we, this was good. This was good. This was good, but Hey, but this didn't work. And here's what we learned. I think that's the key. Yep. Absolutely. So, um, I would be remiss if I did not ask the question most often asked in any kind of major donor training or conversation. And that is, so where do I find, these major donors or these donors of high capacity. Can you speak for just a moment on your recommendations there? Well, my, my, my best recommendation is if you have any, if you have one major donor to your organization, you have access to more than one. Meaning if you can, if you have one person who has been blessed with financial capacity, who really loves your organization, one of the best things that you can do is to try to continue to deepen and cultivate the relationship with that giver so that one of the, the next things you can ask them for is not money, but rather help in identifying others who might share our concern or our passion or our interest in this kind of ministry. So the, the, best, the best way to identify other major givers 
other major donors is by enlisting the few that you might have to help you identify others. Now, keep in mind, many of those folks will be very, very tentative about wanting to open up their, remember when people had Rolodex? We don't have Rolodex anymore, but opening up their, their uh, contact list and sort of letting you have at it, that's not what you're asking. You're not saying, just give me a bunch of names. You're saying, who can we introduce this organization or this ministry to who might share our passion for it? So you're enlisting that person to help you with it. Um, I would say to Kristen, and I don't know how you feel about this, but it is also not, I think it's appropriate to do a little bit of analysis of your existing donor list. There are some external resources out there that you can use, some other third-party organizations that, that can help you do some um, analysis of your current givers. And you might discover you've got major donor capacity already on your list. You've just never known that that's a person who has the ability to give a major gift. So I don't want to, I don't want to mention brands or names, but there are some partners out there that you can reach out to. You send them the, your list, they give you back an analysis of your list and sort of an ability to give kind of a, an enthusiasm to give kind of a capacity score, if you will. Um, I would say those are the best two recommendations I have. If you're starting with no givers and, and uh, you have no high capacity givers, you're going to have to just get out there and tell the story to everybody and see who surfaces. Yeah, I agree with that advice. Um, I would say the other thing is board members, asking mm -hmm. board members to kind of leverage their network a little bit. Um, but like you said, looking at that list, there, it's very likely you've got some folks giving at more of a mid-level that have capacity they just don't have relationship with you yet. So looking for opportunities to grow existing relationships. Okay, another question has come across and that is what about frequency of calls to the different levels of donors? So what does a made, you know, a high capacity donor, to your point at the beginning of this, um, wealth comes with complexity. They're likely very busy individuals and probably pretty cautious with their time, perhaps even have some gatekeepers <laughs> keeping their time mm -hmm. Um, pretty private. So what's appropriate relative to frequency of contact? So the, the best answer to that question is I don't know until I ask that giver and let him or her tell me. So I would, I would recommend that the, the, the gift officer, the development officer simply say in the relationship, hey, what's a good rhythm for you in terms of staying in touch with our ministry? Uh, I'm thinking I'd like to reach out with you, reach out to you maybe two or three times a year. How does that sound to you? well, actually, I think that's too much. Or, you know what, if you just call me, you would just call me every December 1st. That'd be perfect. That's exactly what I, meaning I would, I would ask them to help you answer yep. that question instead of assuming yep. they want to hear from you only once a year or uh, give them options. Look, we've got a newsletter we're going to send out about once a month. I'd, I'd love for you to read it. And my thinking is I'd love to pick up the phone and call you just maybe two or three times a year and check in. And then normally I'm kind of in your town or I'm in your city about once a year. Boy, I'd love to be able to just stop by and personally update you on what's happening in the organization. How does that sound? And normally you'll get a, if you ask it like that, you get a better response. Yep, that's great advice. All right, sir, thank you. Do you have something else you wanted to share or did we? No, I don't think so. I think, that's, I think that's really it. I, I, I really appreciate your, um, inviting me to participate. I, I, I'm very, um, I believe the work that, that the folks who are on this call, the work that you're doing really matters. You know, when you're out there inviting people to give and invest in ministry and in sort of life changing organizations, you're doing good work. And I just, I just feel like some, I know it can be discouraging sometimes. So I would encourage you to keep, keep, trusting the Lord and keep recognizing that the work that you're doing really matters. Cause I think it does. Well said. Thank you, Chris. This yeah. has been fun and insightful. It's a topic that I am passionate about and I love your approach. Um, focusing on relationship and viewing the role really as ministry. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. for those of you who are tuning in, um, Thank you for joining us. I hope this was encouraging and not intimidating, um, but really just an emphasis on relationship. You know, 
there's a book in development called Donors Are People Too. And I think that's a, it seems very obvious and almost silly, but I think it's probably worth writing on a post-it note and putting it on your computer, um, lest you view them as anything but that. And really this is perhaps on another post-it note, it should say, um, you know, ministry, this is the ministry of asking or um, asking is ministry. So I just encourage you to really take a few minutes and, and observe, kind of re, um, maybe watch, or at least flip through the slides that uh, we will be sending out via email tomorrow. So you can, again, just kind of focus on the um, ministry that's involved in development and the importance of discipleship and relationships. Um, so I appreciate Chris's experience and expertise in sharing that. I want to share a couple things with you before you um, go on about your work for the day. Our next webinar will be on marketing and messaging your ministry. That will be on May 21st. You may um, go ahead and register for that now. I know there's so much to consider in the world of marketing. There's a lot of tools available, and we um, want to make sure that you have a strategy in place. So we'll be visiting with Brian Boyd, who has um, really a long history in nonprofit marketing that will be sharing some tips and tidbits for you. Um, if I can be of any help to you along the way, if you want to talk more about what Chris shared today, please never hesitate to contact me. Uh, it is my job and my really desire to help equip you in your development efforts and partner with you as you think more about this major gift strategy and major donor gifts. So um, I really hope this has been beneficial for you and that you um, have learned something that you can put into practice immediately. So be sure to check out our Facebook page like I referenced, connect with me on LinkedIn, and then I will see you back here on May 21st as we begin the conversation of marketing. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Chris. You bet. Take care.